will continue with the, uh, the session titled Point and Extended Defects in Wide Band Gap Systems with a talk from Felix Freytag on polarons and lithium niobate. Yes, thank you. Um, like Mrs. Salem told before, hydrogen is really a defect worth researching on. And I do believe that too. <laughs> and um, in lithium niobate, um, hydrogen is forming an, um, with o oxygen an OH minus complex. And I will look at the vibrational frequency of this OH minus complex and how changes of the fre uh, frequency influences um, the um, lattice structure. And um, yeah, this is my content. I will use um, femtosecond um, pump probe spectroscopy. Um, why I'm using it and not other methods. Um, at the second, I will talk about my um, experimental approach and um, about um, the data. I will find a frequency shift of three inverse centimeters and um, contribute it to the um, generation of small polarons. And um, after that, I will use a combination of a Morse potential and a Coulomb potential to um, describe the change of um, the frequency. But first of all, um, why do we need a new method? I think um, you all know the importance of um, small polarons for various kinds of um, fields in physics. And um, small polarons lead to a, a lattice distortion. And um, to observe lattice distortions, there are um, various kinds of methods um, you use, um, for example, X-ray diffraction, Raman, EPR, and or as a combination to observe the um, lattice structures um, done by small polarons. And, um, but all of these methods have um, drawbacks. Um, they can only um, be at low temperatures if the system has the appropriate spin or um, they even get low time resolution. So I will propose a new method um, with um, visible pump MER probe um, spectroscopy um, with femtosecond laser pulses. Um, first of all, let's look at the OH minus stretching vibration in uh, lithium niobate. We use um, mid infrared radiation to um, excite the um, stretching vibration, and such a stretching vibration can be described by a simple Morse potential. If we now um, generate polarons in our crystal, um, the lattice will change, so it will distort around our um, defect and we got um, an additional term which um, um, modifies our MOS potential and this will also influence the energetic levels of the MOS potential. So um, we've got a change of our frequency as a function of um, delaying time after excitation a generation of our polar ones. And um, what do we need um, for doing such an experiment? First of all, we need something to generate our polarons. Um, therefore, we need, um, um, we're doing that with an OPA with in the visible spectral range by two photon absorption. Uh, we're probing in the mid infrared also with an um, optical parametric amplifier. We use a mercurium cadmium tell telluride um, detector system. Um, with um, 32 pixels to resolve um, the um, OH minus stretching vibration. So we can resolve the whole stretching vibration with only one shot. And um, we also need something to um, um, F for a time resolution. We have the possibilities to access two time windows. First, um, the time window from um, 300 femtoseconds to two nanoseconds. And the second time window is from one millisecond to um, 100, femtose uh, 100 seconds um, by electronic readout. Here I will talk about the um, second time range. Um, yeah, what is um, the OH uh, minus stretching vibration in lithium niobate? Here you see an absorption spectrum. It mainly consists out of three different peaks. 
and um, it depends on the um, position of hydrogen inside the lattice, um, which peak is more dominant. So um, we can attribute this um, peak towards this position in the lithium niobate lattice. We, are, um, we use undoped near stoichiometric lithium niobate. Here you see um, my experimental results inside of one plot. Um, let's have a look at this. Um, at the time zero, we start generating small polarons. And um, you see after that a change in the absorbance. So um, red means we've got a higher absorbance and um, blue means we got um, a less um, absorbance. And we see an immediately a change in our absorbance. And um, you see something like this. Um, here we get a low absorption. The pixel right next to it um, gets a higher absorption. So it's a frequency shift of our um, vibration, of our um, dominant peak. And um, I will now look at um, what happens if we um, uh, let our system relax into the ground state again. So um, this is what happens. It goes back to the zero again. And um, yeah, we can fit this behavior by a stret stretched exponential function. And um, we now compare these data in the mid-infrared with data in the near-infrared, um, which all uh, already have been um, attributed to the um, small polaron um, hopping transport. So um, if we now plot the absorbance in the near-infrared as a function of the absorbance of the, in the mid-infrared, we see a linear dependency. So we can say the um, um, frequency shift we have seen in the mid-infrared is caused by the small polarons. And um, now I try to um, model this case. Therefore, I use um, a 5 times 5 um, hexagonal stoichiometric supercell and um, modify this cell by um, yeah, creating the um, case of a small polaron. We are assuming a whole polaron. It could be also a bound polaron or an exciton. But here we're just um, modeling the whole polaron. And um, by an additional charge at an oxygen atom and by um, changing the positions of the atoms around our charge defect. Um, the change of the positions is scaled by the uh, charge and the distance to the charge defect. And um, yeah, here's our static Morse potential. And um, this is without any um, polaron um, lattice deformation. And now, in addition to that, we have a um, Coulomb potential, which is due to the um, charge of our Hall polaron and the value of our distortion of the lattice. So if the lattice distortion gets higher, we've got a higher um, um, term which is added to the Morse potential. So if we now we model the um, frequency out of the, um, this Morse potential, um, you see that we, um, the higher the absorption, uh, the distortion, the lower is the vibrational frequency. And as I told before, we have found a frequency shift of three inverse centimeters, so we can go back to the uh, distortion of our lattice. And um, this is what you see here. Um, we now um, put into your system the three inverse centimeters, and um, we've seen that the um, distances of the um, closest atoms of the niobium, of the oxygen and the lithium, changes. And um, the, um, for example, the oxygen niobium distance changes by about 15%, or the um, oxygen oxygen distance changes by about 2%. Yeah, let's conclude my talk. We have seen a um, frequency shift of um, three inverse centimeters, which could be attributed to the generation of small polarons. And by this, we got insight to um, the structural changes of the lattice due to the small polarons. 
Um, what we um, can also do is um, maybe confer this method to um, other molecular groups or other oxide crystals. And um, by using um, femtosecond time resolution, we could also get insight to um, uh, ultra-fast lattice distortions. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. So the nature of your uh, polar is a superoxide ion, it's an O2 minus. Um, is, I'm sorry. What is the nature of your polaron? Is an oxygen two minus? Is a superoxide ion? Um, no, the nature of my polaron is the um, defect structure in lithium iodide. So we've got um, um, we've got um, niobium on lithium side, and so we've got a um, certain defect structure, and um, this uh, leads to the generation of whole polarons. So you've got different um, possibilities for um, small polarons in lithium niobate. For example, you can have a charged carrier bound to an, a niobium on a niobium side, or a charged carrier um, bound to a niobium on a lithium side. And um, we are um, observing the lattice distortion due to an electron on an um, oxygen. OK. Another question? Since, since you're using the, uh, the hydrogen as a probe, essentially, yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, to what extent can your ex uh, result then be generalized for, to the small polaron versus a more specific uh, distortion of, a, again, a small polaron, but, but a, a bond that is uh, existing with, uh, close to where the hydrogen is? Um, since, since the shift, you measure the shift, so yeah. the shift uh, determines the environment of the hydrogen or the OH, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how much is it really true to generalize that distortion that you see to, the, to, a, to a polon that does not involve the hydrogen? Um, it's hard to answer, but um, you see that um, here, for example, would be the center of the whole polaron. And the hydrogen is um, really close to, um, to this charge defect. So um, you know um, that the hydrogen is incorporated at exactly this position inside the lattice. So out of this, we can, yeah, we calculate it. Um, yeah, and, and but, but I'm only probing um, the polarons um, near um, the um, hydrogen, yeah. yeah. That's was my question, so yeah. you mm -hmm. cannot generalize that to the others? Um, no, no. Maybe I'll ask a quick question if there aren't others. So, so I might have misunderstood, but it seemed as though the, your experimental values were obtained on non-stoichiometric samples? And they were and sent on a stoichiometric samples. They were stoichiometric? A near stoichiometric, yeah. So, so I mean, um, but there is some variation. Is, uh, can you comment on how comparable the, the experimental results are to the Morse calculations in terms of, because the, the Morse calculations are perfectly stoichiometric? Um, not true. I'm not sure if they perfectly. They done by um, the Morse calculations are done by near stoichiometric lithium ion. As so far as I know, of it is. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? If not, let's thank. <laughs>